What jumped out at me early on in Skybound's Transformers series are the underlying themes about family, life, and death. As we all know, these can be complicated, messy subjects. And one of the many strengths of this series is that author Daniel Warren Johnson doesn't lean on easy answers or platitudes when exploring these themes. Over the course of the second story arc of Transformers, comprising issues 7 through 12, Johnson augments what came before, both cementing earlier ideas as well as inviting readers to see certain aspects in a new light. As was the case in the first story arc, Optimus Prime is a vital character for exploring these themes. Throughout this arc, we've seen Johnson complicate Optimus Prime substantially. Optimus doesn't become a grim anti-hero or anything like that, but for me, his choices in character seemed more straightforwardly noble in the first six issues than they do here. I would argue that in this arc, we see Optimus struggling to hold on to his ideals in the face of the threat posed by the Decepticons. Examples include the unsettling revival of Jetfire, the leaving behind of Jazz and Cliffjumper after the initial attack on the nemesis, not to mention that the final issue of the story arc sees the character literally lose control, entering something like a fugue state and crushing old One-Eye's melon much to his horror. There's also Alita One's assessment of Optimus leaving Cybertron from previous issues that introduces some ethical and philosophical questions about the Exodus, something that, at least for me, generated sympathy for the Autobots that Prime left behind on Cybertron. These these are ethically complex situations, ones with no easy answers, and I don't always paint Optimus in the best light. So, after crafting what many, including myself, believe is one of the best iterations of Optimus Prime out there over the first six issues, why would Johnson chip away at him like this over the next six? I have a few ideas. I think Johnson defines his characters in Transformers primarily through comparing and contrasting them against each other. In the first arc, Optimus was mostly a contrast to Starscream. In the second arc, I think Alita 1 is intended to provide the biggest contrast with Optimus Prime. It's through their respective worldviews and leadership styles that we're able to see Optimus Prime in a new light, but that contrast also reinforces what makes the character so noble and likable. In addition, I also think each six-issue arc has what I'll call a familial antagonist, if you will. In the first arc, this was Sparky, though you have to admit he really turned things around and redeemed himself by the end there. Alita fills both roles here, being the biggest contrast to Optimus as well as being a familial antagonist of sorts. And like Sparky and Spike, Alita and Optimus have a bit of a dysfunctional family dynamic going on. Alita 1's philosophy seems to hinge on the ends justifying any means. This is presented to readers from the drop as we see Alita and her team, who are of a similar mindset, approach their goal of rescuing Ultra Magnus no matter what it costs them. The goal of saving their ally will be worth any toll. There's no denying that this is a noble endeavor, but it's also a telling characteristic for Alita in that it shows that she's willing to do whatever it takes to achieve her goals, reinforced by how she refuses Ultra Magnus's pleas for death. I'm not saying putting Magnus out of his misery would be the right decision, but this does give us some insight into how tightly Alita clings to her ideas and how hard she's fighting to make all the sacrifices mean something in the end. Embroiled in a bitter war for so long, witnessing the ecological destruction of her homeworld, counting the piles of bodies as they stack up. All of this along with the hard choices she's had to make and the responsibility she's had to bear. All of this drives her towards that one goal of ensuring that all the countless sacrifice will be worth it. In the first arc, one of the biggest contrasts between the Autobots and Decepticons is most notable when reading in trade paperback form, with Starscream gleefully killing Carly's father at the end of issue 1, seamlessly transitioning into issue 2 where Optimus accidentally kills a deer. Overall, the difference in those early issues about how each faction values life couldn't be more stark. Issues 7 through 12, however, present a more complicated picture, culminating with Alita 1 showcasing the end point of her philosophy, with the differences between the Decepticons and the Cybertron-based Autobots flattened to be almost non-existent. 
Many of the Decepticons that we've seen have demonstrated mixed feelings about ravaging Earth, but ultimately agree that it's worth it to restore Cybertron. To them, the ends justify the means. And in that way, Alita has become the very thing she was fighting against. An underlying idea that is also stated explicitly, one that I paraphrased from the man himself in a bit of foreshadowing in issue five, when Optimus is talking to Sparky about war. Nevertheless, I don't think the book is a condemnation of Alita One. Rather, her last minute heel turn is presented as the natural consequence and conclusion to the life that she's led, as well as her choice to stay on Cybertron and keep fighting. Alita One, perhaps without realizing it, fully embraces the dysfunction of the brutal war on Cybertron, holding on tightly to the people, things, and ideas that she thinks will make everything she's endured worth it. When the reality is nothing will be worth it, not really because nothing can fill the chasms of what's been lost. The biggest difference between Optimus and Alita boils down to a question. Is it better to hold on when something's not working or let go. Although Optimus Prime states that he planned to return to Cybertron someday when they found a way to retake their planet, this arc and Alita's characterization reveals that Optimus didn't just abandon an unwinnable war. He chose to walk away from the very dysfunction that made it unwinnable. This seems to be an important undercurrent in the series as it keeps popping up in one form or another. An intriguing exchange between Optimus and Alita in issue 12 hints that Prime may have been a much more bloodthirsty, violent warrior at one point. RC, as we know, seems to have had a similar past, wrestling with violent impulses and anger that she tried to leave behind when she left aboard the Ark. And we've seen Carly begin to walk this same path as she sinks further and further into anger over the loss of her father. These ideas even crop up with Cliffjumper and Beachcomber, characters who both want to break the cycles of violence in their own ways. This desire for change and peace and what Optimus and his followers are willing to do to attain it sharply contrasts with Alita and the war on Cybertron. The persistence of these ideas in the series, along with Alita trying to force Optimus to accept that Cybertron is his home and that he's exactly where he needs to be, evokes a kind of broad strokes family dynamic of sorts, suggesting to me that at least part of the reason for the exodus was that Optimus and like-minded Autobots decided to leave Cybertron rather than become people they didn't didn't want to be, to be pulled down by their dysfunctional family who couldn't stop fighting. There's a prescient line in issue two, after Optimus says he knows the human concept of family, where Spike responds, then you know how much of a pain in the ass they can be. Optimus certainly found that out firsthand by the end of this issue, but he responded in the only way he could have, really, a way that reaffirms and strengthens the fundamental appeal of the character. In the final analysis, Johnson chipped away at Optimus during this arc to build him back up, having the character stand his ground by doing what he did millions of years ago when leaving Cybertron, making the difficult choice to walk away, to reject the dysfunction. And he is once again left to wrestle with the unavoidable consequences and guilt of the decision. Overall, the 12th issue of Skybound's Transformers series was cathartic in more subtle ways than the conclusion of the first arc in issue 6, but no less impactful or thought-provoking. This series continues to have a lot of heart, and there's some surprisingly emotional themes for a franchise where the main draw is giant robots punching each other. And those themes are given beautiful visual representation through Jorge Corona's awesome artwork. If you followed my previous videos on the series, then you know I think very highly of Corona's output. Although we've only had six issues of his work on this series, it's already left a big impact on me. Which is not to say it's perfect. I mean, I still find Beachcomber's mangled lettuce fingers from the end of issue nine more than a little unsettling. But overall, Corona has turned in some truly excellent art. Although there are a lot of smooth surfaces on the Transformers character, to maintain the same look that the G1 cartoon had, Corona packs in a lot of surface detail wherever else he can, from all the little touches on Megatron's fusion cannon to the intricate and highly detailed interiors, or even this shot of Cybertron, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. Normally, he does some nice landscapes as well, though they're not really prevalent in this issue. But the point is, he can do it all. Whatever this series demands, Corona has consistently met those demands and exceeded them, in my opinion. 
I think my main gripe, if you could even call it that, is that there are a couple of sequences where it feels like there's something missing. To be clear, I'm talking about the visual flow of action. I'm sure it's due to time and or space constraints. There was, after all, a lot to cram into this issue, but it feels like there's a panel missing here and there. Like, for example, between the two panels where Shockwave transforms and ends up in Soundwave's hand, as well as later on during Optimus's fight with Shockwave. I don't know, it just feels like there should maybe be something else in between Shockwave lunging and then Optimus having him pinned on the ground, but maybe that's just me and in any case, it is a very minor thing. And like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if these moments were condensed for the sake of time and space. And they're still effective as is at the end of the day, but I think it's worth mentioning because I do think these sequences would have benefited from a couple extra panels just to flesh out the action a bit more. Optimus versus the Combaticons is another moment where the action is condensed, but this one is much more successful in my opinion, where I think we fully get everything we need to fill in the blanks of what's going on during the skirt in one panel, no less. And of course, there are examples of the action being much more drawn out as well, like the part where Optimus and Alita give Devastator a one-two attack with Alita eventually tripping the combiner. Personally, I loved this part. I really dug the way the action in each panel is framed. It just gives a real kinetic feel and added drama to the events. This page is another personal highlight, switching between larger panels of the Autobots in Dire Straits and smaller ones, showing the sequence of Carly getting her van, starting it up, and driving it through the warp. The execution here makes the actions depicted feel rapid fire, suitably building up to the satisfying crashing of Carly's van into Soundwave. Another aspect of Corona's art that I enjoy is how he handles violence and gore inflicted on Cybertronians. There are other examples throughout this run, most notably with Starscream in issue number seven, but there's another great example here where Optimus turns Shockwave's head into indiscernible inky blocks of garbage. Somehow, the lack of explicit detail makes it even more brutal. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe leaving more to the imagination? Whatever the case, Corona threads that needle really well with this sequence, and this is maybe a little bit more memorable to me than it would have been if it had been explicitly shown. Which brings us to the body count. We'll add one for Shockwave, and that'll be it for now, at least as far as what seems to be pretty definitive deaths. Cliffjumper's fate is a mystery at the moment, but I'm not ready to write him off just yet. I am half tempted to add Carly's van though, as it was practically a character in and of itself. Oh man, Carly loses her van and potentially cliff jumper in the same issue. Dude, remember in issue eight when Carly said her van was the last piece of her that she had left? Ooh. Ouch. D-dubs going straight for the heart again. No mercy. Anyway, it's about time I wrap this up. I know I didn't touch on everything in a lot of detail here, but I hit the highlights and I wanted to make sure I gave enough space to what I got the most out of with this issue and this arc. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Hit the like button if you liked the video. Hit the subscribe button for more. And thank you for watching this. I hope you have a good rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.